We all have to approach our projects as cooperative team members. Business of Architecture, episode 397. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm speaking with Michael Daddio, founder and principal of Premier Artisanal building firm M. Daddiel Incorporated. Now, Mike is a third generation contracting professional. He's a skilled carpenter and effective leader with a thorough understanding of the process required to bring a highly detailed project from concept to successful completion. Throughout his career, Mike has demonstrated an ongoing commitment to serving the New York community through his active support of several organizations and leading numerous volunteer initiatives to rebuild the homes of New Yorkers whose properties suffered catastrophic damage in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy. He also sits on the board of St. Ignatius School, a middle school dedicated to providing quality education to children in the South Bronx. A native of Long Island, Mike graduated from Providence College, where he double majored in mathematics and quantitative economics. He currently resides in Brooklyn with his family. In this episode, Mike gives us an insight into how his company is structured, the role of the general contractor, and what makes for a very good contractor-client-architect relationship and the key to being able to manage multiple projects and still being a client-centric firm. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Michael Daddio. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Michael, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm very well. Nice to be here, Ryan. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Brilliant. So you are um, the, the, the principal of M. Daddio Incorporated. Um, you're one of the premier contractors uh, in New York. You've got an incredible portfolio of work. The business has got a really fascinating heritage to it it's been a family business of how many generations has it three three, three generations, generations. Yeah. right so start, started by your grandfather that's right yeah he started m daddio inc in 1950 and um his name was michael daddio went by mickey daddio um, yeah and he was a he was a wonderful guy um unfortunately he's he's since passed but he's the reason why i think i have a you know a real innate passion for uh for building and for carpentry and construction and and just making things he was uh he was a hands-on guy himself he was a carpenter he Mm -hmm. came back from world war ii after being a paratrooper which always kind of like you know mystified me as to how somebody could jump out of a plane to begin with yet how Mm -hmm. do you jump out of a plane when you're in the middle of a you know of a war and uh, and have the courage to do all of that it's you know, it's hard enough sometimes to find the courage to face my three kids in the morning, let alone <laughs> jumping out of a plane with a parachute on my head. Yeah, so he, while, whilst being shot at. Yeah, yeah it's, it's exactly right. And holding a gun, uh, you know. So um, uh, after all of that, he came, you know, he came to uh, uh, to New York and um, he started building. And he started in this, uh, this town on Long Island called Levittown, where Mr. Levitt had created a, a development community mm-hmm. where they were building a lot of similar style homes. And he was uh, a carpenter and he had, he would have independent contractors come just like my grandfather and they would be uh, building the house, putting, uh, framing the house and um, putting a roof on doing the sheetrock, all things kind of related to carpentry. Um, and I, I have such a, a fond memory of hearing him, you know, talk about, how he would have to take the 10 penny nails and actually straighten them. If they went in, you know, by hand uh, and they bent, he'd have to pull them back out and he would tap them because part of his contract is he had to pay for, you know, his own hardware. So there was, you know, very much a depression mentality that, um, you know, kind of uh, that he had within him um, Mm. that, um, you know, kind of just made him be a very, very thoughtful, meticulous type of uh of a builder where he had to execute things very efficiently Mm. uh, a lot of the times by himself. Um, And it was, you know, it's very inspiring. There's a lot of math that's involved in that. There's a lot of, uh, you know, pride and, you know, there's a lot of uh, very meticulous focus and attention to detail that, um, 
you know, that he had. And I, I think that kind of just lives within our blood. Uh, it then got passed down from my dad, uh, from my grandfather and my dad. And, uh, and I kind of re, uh, resurrected the name of daddy a wink because it was, you know, it kind of went away for a little while. And, and I brought it back to life in, in many ways, uh, paying homage to my, my grandfather. So, so, so was it a, a kind of carefully planned succession plan of, of the business moving from generation to generation or, yeah, I know that I you went. So. I know that you went and have got a degree in mathematics and and economics, right? Yeah, that's right. It was something that I was always good at, and I was never, you know, I was never much of a student. I didn't just enjoy it, yeah, you know, very much. My mind was always always wandering, which is why I'm thrilled to have my son in a Montessori school now because I kind of feel like the choose your own adventure was much more of my, you know, my personal mm. uh, kind of style. Um, but uh, so yeah, so I. I I didn't intend on joining kind of like the family business and and being a part of that. Um, I had gone off to be a, um, I had hopes and dreams of being uh, in finance and doing what all my clients do. Um, And uh, so I had, I went to college. I was always good at math. So I was kind of naturally a a math major. And then I became an economics major as well. So I double majored in both of those. Um, I love math. It's the way my brain you know, operates. My wife tells me I need more of a touch sometimes, but, you know, I'm just very much, you know, um, so yeah. So after I graduated, um, I thought I was going to go into some sort of a finance, you know, something I didn't really even know what that meant. I still, you know, don't know what it means to be in finance, although I've, I've learned a bit more, it just kind of mystifies me about all these different things. Um, and, uh, you know, I realized I didn't really have much connection to finance or New York City, um, which left me with not a lot of opportunity, which kind of pushed me into thinking about, well, you know, where should I, you know, where should I put my, uh, my efforts? And um, I've been a builder and a carpenter for my entire life. I've just, I've done it as, uh, I guess, my earliest memories being about nine years old. And uh, my dad put up a board of sheetrock. Uh, in our house that he was mm-hmm. renovating the bathroom. And he told me that I could take some joint compound and go ahead and start helping him plaster on this, on this board of, on this board of sheetrock. So it's just been, it's been something I've done forever. I've got such a great level of comfort and fluency with it um, mm. because it's, you know, it's been part of what um, uh, part of what I've been doing um, probably since I was nine. And you know, as a, in college, I would have a part-time job. I'd be on my dad's job sites working as a laborer, working as a carpenter. Um, so then after I graduated, I, you know, I decided to kind of put some more effort into that. And I don't want to make it sound like it wasn't super interesting to me either, that I had all of these dreams of doing one thing and I went into something else. I think it's just the way, you know, life kind of takes you. It kind of takes you uh, to the place that you should be. Um, mm. And um, building's a real passion of mine. So I love it. And I'm glad I'm doing it. Amazing. Amazing. And and so did you pick up the reins of the business quite naturally or did you said you had to kind of bring it back to life a little bit or had the business started to be closed down or what, what was, what yeah, was it was, um, uh, it was a bit slower, you know, my, my dad was starting to do some more commercial work and, right. um, and he was, uh, building shopping centers, um, and from the ground up doing, you know, major renovations on the industrial buildings and things like that. Um, but I just, I had a, I have more of a passion for touching, you know, touching wood and, and being more kind of involved in residential projects. Mm. The, the level of finish is much more, um, it's much more interesting to me. You, have, you see a lot more textures, a lot more finishes and, you know, in a, in a resident, high-end residential home. So I kind of re-erected uh, M. Daddio, um to be specifically and exclusively a high-end residential um, building company. And, and, and how did you start to win those or kind of move into that sector or start winning those kinds of projects? It was a long road um, and it, it wasn't sexy at all, but it was always fun to me. So mm. I, I had a, a, you know, my, uh, my own skill set as, as a carpenter uh, led me to kind of start as a carpentry contractor. So our residential work was mainly uh, working as a carpentry contractor for uh, for other builders. Um, so we started framing homes on the east end of Long Island, 
building grounds up homes, putting cedar roofs on, um, putting cedar siding on, trim, exteriors. And one, once you could build you know, the, the frame of a house, everybody would trust you to do just about anything else. And you know, we had the skill set, obviously, to, to do a number of things. So we started as a car- carpentry contractor. I very much consider myself a sponge, and I have been for my entire career. And I, would, I had the opportunity to work for a number of great general contractors that I hold in very high regard, people that are seasoned, that were doing this for 30 or 40 years. And mm. they would always impose or, um, on me a specific detail of a particular section of the home. And everybody had their own focus. It might have been a special way to flash a window or to put to bend a lead-coated copper drip edge on top of, a, of an exterior trim piece or how the moldings are going to come together and how they're going to be joined or how are you going to scribe and, um, and your base moldings or cope your crown moldings. Everybody had something that they were hyper-focused on. And as a, a young builder uh, that was really interested in just growing my skill set more than anything, I would take each one of these items um, these pearls from each one of the, uh, the builders I would work for. And I would just kind of soak them in. Then I would do, I would regurgitate them in many ways and kind of uh, improve upon them on all of my projects. Well, th- this is really interesting actually, because you were, we were saying just before we started talking here that, you know, you're going for your own renovations at, at the moment and you've got the builders in, in, in your own home. What sorts of insights has that given you in terms of, the service that you provide for your own clients and, you know, and, and something that we can all learn from uh, in terms of like what it's, what, what it's like client side when your yeah. house is being ripped apart. We don't and, always and, have the opportunity. And, and put together again, obviously in a beautiful yeah, way. Yeah. <laughs> we don't always have the ability to you know, understand what our clients are experiencing. And I think for a lot of the time I didn't, I wouldn't be able to afford to do my own renovation. So how can I really understand and empathize, empathize with my clients on what they're experiencing? We are always seeking to give them the best experience. So I was always a very good listener and understanding what is important to you. Let me understand so I can help um, to make this a fun experience. So what, what I've kind of learned, I've got three kids um, that are under four. So my life is, is upside down, you know, at home all the time. We're always chasing around kids. We're always focused on nap time. We're always focused on cleanliness. And when I bring in a team of my electricians who do wonderful work um, and who I've worked with for the past 10 years, uh, you know, the level of, of, of noise that gets created when somebody is snaking a wire or when BX uh, electric cables runs along a metal stud the noise resonates throughout the house and you know, what you think might be quiet work when you're working in a basement and you're doing some minor electric work, you don't realize is waking up your two-year-old on the, on the second floor and it drives you absolutely bonkers. And it's, it's your, it's my own fault for not being able to, it's no one's fault, but you gotta, you really have to go through it first, I think yeah. in order to, um, to really understand. So it, it's, it helps me to, to empathize with my clients having, gone through now the pain of several of my own personal renovations and, um, you know, understanding that, you know, cleanliness, noise, nap time, booties, white glove, drop claws, protection, 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 Mm -hmm. you know, just making sure that what we're executing is, is done under an enormous amount with an enormous amount of thought. Yeah. When you're dealing with the, well, before we go into that, is it predominantly now the portfolio of work that you're doing high-end residential? Do you do any other kinds of, of buildings or projects? Do you, do you do commercial work anymore or is it solely focused in the one niche? We're 100% high-end residential. That's what we focus. And we have such a, that sector of the industry has so many different facets which is what I love about it. We're building in Sag Harbor, restoring and expanding an 1890s uh, built balloon framed uh, whaling house that's on Main Street. We're got renovating a, uh, and expanding a townhouse also built around the same time, but completely different construction with, uh, uh, with brick party walls and, 
uh, and very specific SOE requirements to expand a, a town when you have townhouses around you know three sides of you in Brooklyn right now. We're combining condos and co-ops in Manhattan on Fifth Avenue around Park Avenue, um, and we're doing gut renovations of Tribeca lofts. Um, while we're also working upstate on some renovations of, uh, of homes. And then we also have an opportunity, we, we build new homes, which we, you know, we do regularly from the ground up. So you know, each one of those are a very unique um, skill set uh, and experience set um, mm. that you need to have in order to effectively to renovate. And to me, it's what keeps me very interested being, a, being that our firm is able to, uh, to work and execute each one of those very different types of uh, uh, renovations uh, very well. How would you describe what your role is as a general contractor, either to a client and to an architect? Good question. The, the easy answer, the thoughtless answer is, you tell us what to do and we build it, right? Yeah. But it's so much more. We are a, um, we're a team member, right? And I think that what happens is we all have to approach our projects as as cooperative team members. And that includes the architect, the design professional, the general contractor, and the client. And we all know we're serving the client and we do everything we can to be incredibly client-centric. Um, but uh, our role is to engineer the, the details and the, uh, the aesthetic specifications of uh, our clients, our, uh, the architecture firms and design firms that, uh, that we work for, uh, and to be the team member that says, um, we understand what you're trying to achieve here. And we think that based on these field conditions, these are three options on how we can execute in this challenging situation, um, your, uh, your design intent. What do you think? So we're, we're here to be experts in engineering the building process to bring means and methods, which means uh, an experience set of, uh, of steps in order to efficiently and effectively execute a project uh, to the highest standards possible, um, to manage a client's budget, client's budget expectations, and to very carefully make sure that everybody understands where there are unknowns mm -hmm. and to highlight those unknowns in yellow and circle it in bright pink and to put a star next to it and say, we've done our very best to, uh, to be responsible about these unknowns, but these are the areas that you should understand that there could be budgetary impacts. Um, and we wanna make sure that you've got a very good understanding of what that could be. So that when you, when everybody or clients are, are considering moving forward with the project that they've got a solid understanding of the financial requirements and the time requirements in order to execute this. Well, what makes for a very good relationship between that triad, you know, that triad between you, client and architect? When does it work and when does it not work? That's a good question. Um, I think um, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, it works well when there's no ego. Mm. involved. It works really, really well when everybody is respectful of the skill sets that the other people bring to the table. And, um, and we learn, we're excited to learn from every architect and from every client on every single project. There's always a detail similar to the general contractors I was talking about earlier. There's always a detail that we get to learn from our architects uh, that we work for. And there's always, a, there's always details that we bring to them. So I think having a collaborative approach where all team members feel the same way, that we have the same end result, our same end goal to, um, to build a beautiful project, to have, a, you know, to have our clients have a positive experience and enjoy it. Because if you can make the execution of construction a secondary thought, something yeah. that we know is just going to, it's going to, ex it's a commodity now for us. We execute this work well. We build it really well. Let's work on the client experience. Um, and that's what we're really focused on is making sure that our clients have a great experience. Um, and I think uh, when clients come to projects with an unrealistic budget, um, 
that's when things can go awry. So, so long as we do, and specifically me, I do my job within my firm to make sure our clients understand um, what this is going to cost and what the time, what time is this going to take. The rest of it falls into place very nicely. It, it, it's just interesting, actually, when you talk about the, the budget that clients have, and you know, many times a client has an uneducated budget, for example. It's just a number that they've picked out that they would like it to do, and it doesn't really match their expectations or what it is that they want to do. Yes. Um, uh, and, and obviously, from the architect's side, depending on where you're coming in on the project, typically when you come into a project, does the, has the client approached you and then you're responsible for building a team and sometimes you introduce an architect? Or is it more often the case that an architect will invite you to tender for a project? Uh, it comes both ways for us. We, we have a lot of you know, personal relationships with friends, friends of friends, family, and they'll come to us and we'll refer you know, an architect. But uh, I would say most typically an architect is sending us a set of a set of drawings at some phase. They may not be fully through their um, the construction documents phase yet. We might get involved a little bit earlier, but most mm-hmm. of the time an architect will come to us with a set of drawings. And, and how do you like to manage the client's expectations then of what their budget actually can afford them? Is it a, a process where you prefer to be involved earlier on and have that kind of negotiated tender process or do you quite like the process where you know you get given a, a set of construction documents and then you've got to go away and bid against three other three other contractors? Well, from a, I think that the, um, the your your first one is the uh, is the best way. We we like to be introduced to projects early on. Mm-hmm. Um, I like your choice of word and the tender approach because I think it is a much more tender approach when a builder can get involved early on and provide budget parameters to a project. We have a very strong sense of what what it takes, regardless of if the floors are going to be, you know, uh, walnut or white oak, or if the walls are going to be level five or level four Venetian plaster. Um, the, uh, the, the nuts and bolts of a project is going to have a cost to it. Mm-hmm. And all of, the, all of the upgrades within it, although it can amount to a significant amount of money, you know, maybe that equates to 20, 30%. So we can get a really good sense of 70 or 80% uh, of what a project is likely going to take with very little information. Um, and uh, if we're engaged up front, we can provide accurate budget impacting numbers to scope as the architectural drawings become developed. Should we take down that rear wall of the townhouse and put in a two-story beautiful uh, metal window structure with black and steel with a wax finish and you know all of these things um, what does that do to our budget and before it gets designed detailed engineered and then bid by three contractors right away we can say that is going to be approximate budgetary impact of x to y and within that range, you can. Ex- do you want to go forward um, with all of the detailing, understanding that it's going to have that sort of an impact to your project? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that it informs the client, and it's a more efficient process for the client for them to understand. And some architects um, are excellent at doing this. Some architects don't have as much of a skill set in budgeting, um, and some architects do. Um, you know, a, a better job at managing expectations of budget if they have that, uh, that level of skill. And um, uh, so if you do go out to bid with three bidders and you go through the whole design process, if the architect's given you, you know, a very good understanding of a range per square foot of what it's going to cost, and that's, you know, then I think that can be okay too. But um, mm. the earlier on we're involved. I think, you know, the better it is for the client to understand. And sometimes they just need another voice. No matter how many times, you know, one person, their architect is telling them this is going to cost that. Sometimes it's very beneficial to have another professional experienced in budgeting to be able to reinforce that, yes, this is going to have a real impact. And it is a significant scope. I've always found it interesting. I mean, I've always thought that it works really nicely when you when you do have a, a builder involved much earlier on in the project and they can start to inform the design 
with their understanding of like how much it's going to cost. And, you know, it's kind of like you're giving, you're able to give more of a definitive cost as a, rather than say using a QS or leaving it all to a, a very refined set of drawings. And then you go out to, to tender or to bidding with, with three other contractors. And it's the first time that they see the project and now they're all bidding, you know, now it's a price war. And that has its own problems because you're going to get people being deceptive at times. You know, they're, they're, they're putting in an under, you know, I was speaking to someone today where they were, they were talking about, you know, you, you, you put in a lower, putting it, the builder puts in the lower price in order to try and, you know, make up the money later on in the project, which becomes, yeah. it becomes complicated for the client. Whereas doing it like this with a more negotiated tender up front, you're able to, bring expertise to the to the project sooner the client can get more clarity um what what are your what are your thoughts on you know as a business going through the the, the tendering process where there's where you're up against three other people well for us it's in the back of our minds all the time mm -hmm. and you know we're like well We'd love to do this project, depending on what it is. And we know there's going to be other build, uh, bidders. But for us, our process doesn't change. Mm -hmm. We are we price it the same way for everybody that comes to us. Um, we use our takeoffs, our, unit, you know, our, uh, our units of measure, our square footage, linear footages, um, in order to put together our numbers. And we just detail our budgets incredibly well with the uh, intention of providing accuracy and transparency to each one of those, uh, those areas of work. So um, in, in an effort mainly so that a client can understand what they are getting, where we've made some suggestions and highlighted those areas, if something wasn't perfectly clear on the drawings, um, and then to give everybody an opportunity to understand how they could value engineer or how do we reshape the budget in other words, so that we can, you know, find the areas that are having the largest impact to budget. And how do we redefine the scope? Um, how do we break it into phases? What mm -hmm. other, you know, holistic project approaches can we take so that our client can get what they need now? Um, and that might be the whole project, or maybe we can get them three quarters of the way there with a very good plan for a phase two and or a phase three and have that global plan um, impact the way in which we, you know, we choose to phase our project so that um, we're cognizant of, of budget limitations and we're also cognizant of uh, efficiencies and, uh, and inefficiencies and overlap and how do we mm -hmm. reduce that. Um, so yeah, so was, I mean, you could, as I say it all out loud, you could, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things involved with, you know, uh, how do you start to spearhead and guide a client to, you know, to understanding, you know, what their budget is, what they can get, how do they phase, mm. um, and uh, what are the, you know, effective, what are the efficiencies and what are the inefficiencies of, of each approach? How do you, as a, as a business owner, um, manage your own profit on a project? Because this, you know, if I, I always think for an architectural service, it's relatively simple, well, it's simpler, or it appears simpler anyway, um, than what the contractors are doing and the risk that the contractor is taking on and the complexity that, you've, that you're dealing with, with all of the materials, sub-consultants, and you know, you're, op you're always constantly operating on what are often quite tight margins. How do you, what, does, what are the sorts of processes that you use internally to ensure that a project is able to maintain profitability? And you know, when you recognize it's not going to be profitable, what do you do? Good question. And the answer is we do the same thing no matter what. So if we, it's our job to be responsible professionals and provide budgets that when we agree to it and we shake hands, which is all we need, um, we are going to execute that scope of work for the price that we said we're going to. So if something is not going to make money, um, it doesn't change our process or our approach. Right. It's obviously not the reason why we're in business, but we understand that making sure our clients have a great experience, irrespective of all of the challenges of how the sausage is made, uh, is our number one, you know, uh, is our number one company goal and objective. Mm. Um, we manage our budgets by doing 
very, very detailed budget takeoffs. And in talking about my roots of starting as a carpentry contractor and somebody who installed cedar shake by hand and, um, you know, sheetrock and tile and, and all of these components, because we've, we've done, and I've specifically done all of these trades myself, I have a very strong understanding of what it actually takes to execute it. And mm -hmm. that makes that, that makes our budgeting and estimating a very accurate process. So we typically don't have those type of issues because right. we're so in tune with what the cost is and we know how, much, how long it takes. And we employ um, our own staff to execute a lot of that work. So for a number of trades, we are not looking to outside resources. We have our own team members that have been with us for, geez, you know, 10, 12 years uh, in some cases, uh, and even longer, actually, now that I think back on it. Um, and we just, we know, we all know how, uh, how to work, the expectation of the finish. So mm -hmm. none of this stuff is a mystery to us. Um, sure, we make mistakes and we miss something. And if we miss something, we say that we missed it. And that's our responsibility to correct it. That's not the client's responsibility. Would you better um, kind of give us a little bit of a insight into how the company is actually structured in terms of you know employees, team members, who who there is like kind of permanently, and then how do you you know build teams for specific projects? Yeah, so our our team structure is set up um, so that every project gets a project manager, uh, a site supervisor. And we have an assistant project manager. And we also recently have added a full-time purchasing department that's solely responsible for making sure that we are purchasing all of our materials and finishes. Um, so project management, uh, first and foremost, they handle all of the, um, all the client and architect interactions and they uh, coordinate the project, make sure it's on schedule, on budget, um, Assistant project managers are, are helping to um, uh, keep up with the paperwork end of it, which becomes pretty heavy when you're really trying to organize a project. Mm. We use Microsoft Project uh, as a way to create Gantt charts and schedules and define critical paths so we can you know, best understand what requires the most amount of focus. Um, and in doing that, um, we can create a Gantt chart that doesn't mean anything, or we can create one that really attempts to understand and be a useful tool throughout the duration of construction. So um, creating our project schedules, uh, creating our RFIs, organizing our questions, RFIs, requests for information, is a way in which we organize all of our questions, very typical for um, architects and, and general contractors. Um, change orders, which is such a dirty word in this business, right? But uh, we keep, a, keep uh, the project managers and assistant project managers keep track of our change orders, change order logs, uh, our submittals to ensure that our finishes are, uh, are that we're going to be purchasing are accurately, um, uh, are accurate and, uh, uh, and reflect what the clients are, uh, want to, want to purchase from a finish standpoint, from a quantity standpoint, from a manufacturer standpoint. Um, and then our purchase department, all they do is purchasing, which is wonderful because especially in these days of COVID, um, we need to be executing our orders really up front in, in many ways, what I would call a pre-construction phase before a project starts. We'd like to mm. order all of the long lead um, finishes. Appliances are now taking six, eight, nine, ten 10 months in certain instances and longer. Uh, they used to take two or three. So we have to order those, those products before the project starts in order for wow. them to slate into our critical path at the right time so we don't have a delay in month eight. Mm. So the thinking of a project is a um, big responsibility for the, uh, the project management team. Um, and then we have our, for me, our, one of our most important team members, I almost want to say our most important team members, but at the end of the day, there's a person standing in, a, in your home and they're the one that's going to be installing the molding, supervising the subcontractors and making sure that everything is done well. And that's our site supervisors, which for me are, are really the, I feel like I work for our site supers, mm -hmm. even though I own the firm, it's my responsibility and our project management team's responsibility to make sure that team member is fed with vendors, materials, labor, and resources that they need in order to execute the project um, quickly, efficiently, and to a super high quality. Um, 
So uh, we have our accounting staff, obviously, that's keeping track of budget um, and uh, keeping track of our own company finances, uh, coordinating the, uh, the execution of, uh, uh, of payments to vendors, maintaining um, logs that show which vendors have been paid, what the remaining balances on their contracts are, and also uh, making sure that we're collecting all lien waivers from them. So this way, although it's very rare, if you have a, an issue with somebody, we want to make sure that we have all the lien, excuse me, all of the lien waivers collected for all of the subcontractors so that we're protecting both ourselves and our clients uh, from anyone who may try to, uh, to file a lien that, um, that wouldn't be appropriate um, given how much they've been, uh, they've been paid to date. So, um, that's a, it's a, it's a big effort. There's so many different people uh, involved. And then we have our teams broken down further into um, our director of operations who helps to manage our, our, our HR um, and our process. Um, we have our carpenters, our painters, our tile installers, our own mill workshop out on Long Island, right in the middle of Long Island so that it services both our Manhattan projects and our Hamptons projects right, um, wow. within striking distance. And uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of moving parts um, to our business and how, uh, thank how, God for all my team members. How does it, how does it work when you've got numerous projects kind of being operated on or being built at the same time? How many, what's the sort of maximum number of projects that you'll have at any one go typically? Right now we're likely building between 30 and 40 projects. And they vary in size and they vary in complexity and they vary in project uh, uh, in this, uh, the state of the project where, where we are. Some are in punchless phase, some are in, you know, some were framing, some were just starting, some were in pre-construction. Mm-hmm. So it kind of varies, but it's um, human capital. It's not a mystery to any business that human capital is the most important thing. The people that I work with are the only reason why we can be, doing this many projects simultaneously and as well as we do. Mm. Our, our team is full of rock stars, in my opinion. We have, uh, I've worked with them for a long time. They've been trusted, have trusted resources. Um, and everybody in the same way that uh, we thought about collaboration when it comes to client, architect, and contractor, there's a huge amount of collaboration with our own team. Um, and we all have something that's very, very important that we bring to the table. And I think there's a, uh, there's a large amount of respect and, um, you know, and, and want for, um, for knowledge and to, to be transferred from our senior PMs to our PMs and from our site supers to our project managers and, you know, from our site supers to our carpenters to, you know, better, uh, you know, teach them how to do things even, even better and grow. So it's, uh, it's the human capital aspect that, you know, is, is what allows us to do that many projects very well. Uh, in addition to our software system that we use. So we have a, um, a project management software system that we use that allows us to um, create weekly reports, daily logs, um, and organize all things related to the project management of a, of a project. Um, our site supers are posting daily logs and photographs on every single one of our projects every single day. At the end of every week, all of our clients get a weekly report generated with photographs that also explains what happened that week and what happened next week, what's going to happen next week. Um, And I find that those processes eliminate a lot of the anxiety that clients have. Um, And when things, the construction is not a game of perfect. It's a game of transparency, honesty, and an intent to always do the very, very best that you can. Mm. So when we honestly communicate what's happening, whether or not it's good or bad or great, um, then it relieves the stress and the anxiety from our clients that they may walk on site and discover something that they think that they need to bring to our attention. Yeah. Our, the objective of our weekly reports is to let our clients know transparently, this is what happened. If for some reason the plumber didn't show up on Thursday, he's going to be there on Monday. He might have had a personal thing that he has to deal with. It's not a mystery to us. He's going to be there on Monday. And um, the work has continued in these three other areas while they weren't there. And right. it's not something to get excited about. It's just something to communicate openly about. Um, so that's been a key to one of the, you know, to, to be able to manage so many projects and, and being still a, at the root of this, a client-centric firm. Mm, love it. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier about, 
you've got a team of rock stars. How how do you find rock stars? How do you how do you attract high caliber talent into your business? Not only attract them, how do you keep them around? What do you think some and some of the your some of the keys that you've discovered in in being able to do that? No, that's another good question. I uh, for me, rock stars attract rock stars. I don't know how many times that I find some one of our carpenters whose brother and cousin and uncle just so happens to also be an amazing, smart, talented carpenter. Mm. So what we do is we, once we found our initial group, which was very, very challenging and it took a long time, we've expanded through our own internal resources just without going to, we're not going to outside head headhunters and saying, can you find us a person? We go to our own team members of people that we already know and saying, who are your friends? Who do you know? Who do you like? Who have you worked with before? And that has always yielded more and more great team members. Brilliant. I so that's, that. yeah, that's been. And, and, in, and in terms of keeping them around or keeping, keeping people like that in the business? Well, that's, that's simple. You just have to pay them, you know, as much or more than they would get anywhere else. Right. So one of the yeah. things I think I like very much, and which is why I've gotten into this business and being in, being an entrepreneur is I, I, I didn't like the, you know, any sort of company cultures that I saw at other large firms. And uh, uh, I, there's a certain lifestyle and a certain amount of respect that I want all of our you know, employees to have. And I want them to be able to spend time with their families, uh, especially now as a dad myself. Um, so I like that I have the ability to create a company culture that's reflective of, of my own personal values of being able to spend time with family, take time off, work from home, um, wherever possible. So um, I think that having, you know, a great company uh, set of values and a company culture that's really attractive, it's actually mm -hmm. number one more than anything. Um, and, you know, secondarily, we understand that everybody is, is working to feed their own family. So we have to give them very, very competitive, if not more wages to, uh, to make sure they stay. And that's the recipe. Um, yeah. And that means we're not the least expensive contractor on the block. That means we have the best team members that are attracted because they have a great culture and they get paid um, uh, very, very well. And that's why we can rely on our, on our staff. And uh, I can confidently go out to any family and say, we will deliver you a beautiful new home for your family in X amount of time because of our, our human capital in this company culture. I love it. it the, the company culture is, is interesting. Is this something that you inherited from your, your grandfather? Are, are some of his values still very much, I mean, you can hear the, the attention to detail and that you, you, know, you were saying about the maths and how careful he was about um, you know, keeping costs. That sounds like that's still very much alive. Um, were, were some of the company culture that he had established, what is... What is what still remains of that today? And when you took over the business, did you? What was your process of reinventing or refreshing that those values? It's a good question, and I like the way you even asked it too, because I, you know, I think that we um, we are very much a sum of you know our uh, our predecessors, right? Mm. Our, our our fathers, our mothers, uh, our family. So I think that those values that he has um, and that he had just very much get transferred down to us genetically. And, you know, so I, I don't even know if it's something, I'm sure it's learned. Um, there's a, a, an aspect of it that's, I think, innate, um, that we just, we have the values that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've been taught growing up never to, never to have anything impose upon, you know, your own moral code and your own, your own values. So I think we've just continued to take that type of, these are not new, these are not new ideas to be kind to one another, you know, to show up for one another, to do your best, to be thoughtful with one another. And, um, and to be honest, in mm -hmm. many ways, I think that if we can take a lot of us, if we could take kindergarten and pre-K over, it might do us all, you know, a lot of good just to remind us of those kind of basic values that we all need to maintain. And if we create a company culture, that's, you know, that's based on our kindergarten education, I think, you know, I think we'll all do great. 
Love it. Brilliant. I think that's the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation, Mike. Thank you so much for giving us a, a deep dive look into the heritage of MDADIO and your role and how you have been able to deliver such brilliant projects with your clients. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Ryan. Pleasure to be here. My pleasure. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.